Good evening. Great to have everyone here this evening for our Sunday evening worship. We're going to start out this evening for our prayer with uh, sanctuary. Oh Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. Thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, teach your children to stop the fighting, start uniting all as one. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for letting us all have the uh, ability to be here. Uh, please help those of our number who are sick or not able to be here for any reason. Um, please help camp to go well. Uh, please help it to result in, in souls being brought to you as, as Christians being encouraged. And please help everybody to be safe and healthy. Um, please help the the United States as we're dealing with this pandemic and and please help everybody across the world with this pandemic please uh, vanquish it please put it away uh, quickly um, but all according to your will uh, please help us to be forgiving and gentle people please help us to have concern for those around us 
and please forgive us of our sins. This will we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Our song for the lesson this evening will be As the Deer. And then, let's see, we have an invitation song, B818, after our lesson, As the Deer. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. You. to open up your Bibles to Joel. We're going to be talking about the prophet Joel tonight. One of these days, one thing I would like to do is take a songbook and write down everything about the songs that have some sort of meaning to them because they're associated with things to me anyway. That song that you just sang is one of the songs that I used to sing to put my kids to bed when they were all little. And it's a, it's a worship or speaking to God in that song, but I can't help but think about little tiny baby Luke and singing to him when he was just a little baby. Now he's bigger than me. I need to write that stuff down somewhere. I'll forget it someday. I tell you because I'd like for you to remember it for me. <clears throat> okay, so tonight we're going to do Joel. It's only three chapters, but uh, they're longer chapters. It's a couple pages, so we're not going to actually read the entire book, but this is something you can do on your own tonight uh, after we talk about it and we get some information about the book and what's going on. I hope that you do read it tonight, talk about uh, the book with the people uh, that you live with and or that you're hanging out with tonight, that would be that would be fun. There's a couple things about Joel that are some pretty normal questions for study. Um, Joel is not like any other prophet in this way. Um, we just don't know very much about the fuller picture with Joel. There's a lot of questions that I can't answer. And so I'll throw, I think I've got four of them right at the very start that I'll throw them up on the board. 
And all of these questions are, here's a question that we would say about every single prophet getting started. But with Joel, I say, I don't know. Um, I don't know anything about Joel, the man, um, his history. That, that's not unique. There are some other people that we don't know a whole lot about. But chapter 1 and verse 1, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. That's all that we know um, about him. Whenever we do the different prophets, I like to talk about the audience. And I, I put up my timeline and I say, well, here are the prophets. And are they speaking primarily to Israel? Is there a message to Israel? Is there a message to Judah? There's a couple of prophets who are outside, like Obadiah speaks to the Edomites. And Jonah at least has a section of the book of Jonah where he talks to uh, Assyria. And so... Who is he talking to? And I can't really answer that question either. There are a couple of things about Joel, though, that I would point you to on this one. In Joel chapter 2 and verse 1, Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming near. Chapter 2 and verse 15, Blow a trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast. Zion is the hill that the temple was built on top of. Chapter 3 and verse 1. For behold, in those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. And then in verse 16, the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. Um, there are some yeah buts that are attached to every single one of those verses, but... Those four verses might be just as good of help as any to figure out who he's talking to. Maybe Jerusalem seems like Judah. Maybe. Um, and so I, that's the only thing I can really give you on that one. With the occasion of the book, the occasion is, why is this prophet writing? What is he addressing? And you can go through... We will go through each of the different ones. Dave talked about Jonah, and um, I like in Dave's lesson how he specifically... So often, this is a mistake that I think lots of people make with, with Jonah, as they say, Jonah's message is to Nineveh 40 days, and you're going to be destroyed. Um, but that's not the message of the book of Jonah. Um, Jonah is written to the people of God. And so we talk about that. What's going on when he writes and why is he saying this and what are the circumstances and Amos and we'll talk a lot about Amos in that and we'll talk a lot about Jose in that. You can answer these questions. With Joel though, we don't really know what the crime was. We don't know what God is really mad about and upset about. I mean, you can say sin, but we don't know what, who, I mean, if we don't know who he's talking to, then we don't really know what they've done. And so that's kind of hard. And then this is the biggest one with Joel. And the reason why I'm doing it first, just to mix things up. Normally, when I'll talk about Joel, I put it last. Because I don't know where to put Joel in the timeline. I don't know where he belongs. Um, and I've got some stuff up here. I think, if I'm not mistaken, I, I'll click the button four different times. I think I've got four different things. Just to show you. This is a sampling of the kind of thing you're going to get with Joel. Many scholars date Joel to the post-exilic period. So um, Israel was destroyed. Judah kept going. They went into Babylonian captivity. That's the exile. And he says Joel is post, after the exile. Babylonian exile. Although some interpreters said it in the 9th century B.C. That would be way before um, way before uh, the Babylonian captivity, treating it as the earliest book of prophecy. And so that's kind of funny to me because depending upon who's taking their best guess about when Joel is written, somebody will say, Joel is the earliest prophet that we have in the Bible. And another person will say, no, Joel is one of the last prophets. Haggai and Zechariah and Ezra and Nehemiah and all those guys. That's a pretty big spectrum. Like that's a, so he's the earliest. No, he's the latest. <laughs> that's a, that's kind of a big deal. So look at this. Here are different opinions. Conditions reflected in the book suit the rule of Joash while he was still underage. That's 870 to 860. If you want some, um, 
a, a timeline. The Babylonian captivity, the start of that is 605. So we're like more than 200 years before that. That's what this one is saying. Based on the implication that Israel and not Judah is scattered and on the perception of Greece as a distant land, a late pre-exilic date. So before the exile, but just before the exile, just before 605. Um, about 400 BC, that's way down the line, almost, um, almost to Greece. Like that's way after the, the exile. So I just show that the different options to kind of illustrate the spectrum and to say, well, I don't know very much about Joel. I don't know who he's writing to. I don't know what God is mad about when he writes to Joel. And I don't know when Joel uh, fits into the timeline. That's not just something for fun. I think there's a point that comes from that. And, and we'll finish with that. Here's what we do know about Joel. God is upset with his people and he is going to send a plague to devastate the land because whoever he's talking to has turned away from him and God's not having it anymore. Look at chapter 1 and verses 1 through 4. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel, hear this, you elders, Give ear all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children to another generation. This is what's happening. What the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten says to this group of people that uh, here's what's happening to you. I'm sending grasshoppers and they're destroying the land. And they're going to destroy all the land. And they're not going to miss anything. Throughout Joel, it's not just grasshoppers. You'll also see a picture of drought. God's going to sh uh, shut the, the rain off so that the people aren't going to be able to grow their, their food. But here's one of the questions that we'll ask. I'm already gearing up with my argument with Kevin about this after the lesson <laughs> because we've talked about this before. And when I thought I was prepared for this lesson, I got a little bit more prepared because I know that you're going to throw some stuff at me and I want to be ready for it. So the question about the grasshoppers or the locusts in Joel is, is there really a plague, a swarm of locusts that's going to come and destroy the land and they're going to eat all the food. You know, that's something that's going on in Africa right now. You can just, you can just Google African locust plague. It's like a biblical proportion locust plague happening in Africa. It's been going on for, for more than a year now. And you can see a picture of how devastating this would be to a group of people. Is it an actual literal locust plague or are the locusts a figurative picture of a destroying army that's going to come and conquer the people? And I'm going to argue for the army. I think that it's not really locusts. I think the locusts are um, describing that. Look at chapter 1 and verse 7. My vine and splintered my fig tree. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made white. That sounds like like a grasshopper eating all the plants and, and all of the life away from the land. In chapter 2, in verses 24 and 25, one of the, one of the things that Joel says is, I'm going to restore the land. And listen to what he says about how I'm going to restore the land. The restoration makes you think a literal, actual grasshopper plague. Um, so chapter 2 and verse 24, the threshing floors shall be full of grain, the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent among you. So God 
says, when you repent and come back to me, I'm going to give you everything back that the locust ate. Look at chapter 1 and verse 6, though. There's a few clues in here that make me think, okay, we're not really talking about grasshoppers. Chapter 1 and verse 6 says, I guess let's start in verse 5 just to get the, the flow. Awake, you drunkards, and weep and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are lion's teeth, and it has the fangs of a lioness. My vine and splintered my fig tree. It has stripped off the bark and thrown it down. So is God saying the locust plague that's coming in is a nation and an army that's conquering the people? It kind of sounds to me in verse 6, though, like a nation has come up against my land, powerful and beyond number. Um, I, I lean more towards the idea of the locusts are figurative for an army. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming near, the day of the Lord is People, their like has never been before, nor will be again after them through the years of all generations. It sounds like here comes the army of people that's going to that's gonna destroy you. So let's read chapter 2 in verses 3 through 11. And here's the question. This is what you would talk about. Please do this. I, I, want, I want these lessons to be conversation starters so that when we leave here, you get in your car and you talk about the Bible with your kids. You talk about the Bible with your husband or your wife. So here's your conversation tonight. I'm going to start in verse 3 and I'm going to read down through verse 11. And the conversation is, is he describing grasshoppers and locust plague? Or is he describing an army, an invading army that's going to come and conquer the people? Chapter 2 and verse 3. Fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but behind them a desolate wilderness, and nothing escapes them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses. Um, one of the things that you'll see in like a commentary or a study Bible on this... Take a grasshopper's face. It kind of looks like a horse's face a little bit. That's one of the things people say about this. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses and like war horses. They run as with the rumbling of chariots. They leap on the tops of mountains like the crackling of a flame of fire devouring the stubble. Like a powerful army drawn up for battle. Before them, peoples are in anguish. All faces grow pale. Like warriors, they charge. Like soldiers, they scale the wall. They march, each on his way. They do not swerve from their path. They do not jostle one another. Each marches in his path. They burst through the weapons, uh, the weapons and are not halted. They leap upon the city. They run upon the walls. They climb upon up into the houses. They enter through the windows like a thief. The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are darkened and the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord utters his voice before his army, for his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful, for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? So that is the thing that needs to be settled on this question. An actual locust plague, or is that figurative language for a conquering army? But here's the thing about that. No matter what you say, and this is one of our main takeaways from this lesson as we think about the book of Joel. No matter what you say, this thing is still from God, and the picture is a picture of complete destruction and devastation because the people have turned away from God. 
the question of grasshoppers versus army doesn't really matter. It's the, the point that God is saying, you have turned away from me, and this is what's going to happen. A couple verses to point to that. In verse one, chapter 1 and verse 15, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and as destruction from the Almighty it comes. That is one thing that's certain about this text, is that it's God who is creating this situation. Chapter 2 and verse 11, The Lord utters His voice before His army, for His camp is exceedingly great. He who executes His word is powerful, for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? One of the things that I think about with, with this part of the message of Joel is one of the conversations that sometimes comes up about hell. What's hell going to be like? And there's lots of different questions about hell. And, um, you know, we, one of the main factors of hell, one of the things that, that I think the Bible points to more than anything else is, hell is separation from God. Being removed from the presence of God. And so somebody will say, how can God be everywhere but he's not in hell. Or this is another favorite that, that sometimes people will say. That they'll talk about hell is a place of eternal and everlasting darkness. But it's also a place of eternal and everlasting fire. How can there be fire and darkness in the same place? And that's kind of like the grasshopper or the army thing. Let's not miss the point. The point is complete destruction. And whether it's drought and famine... Or destruction at the hands of an army. You're either going to be stabbed to death or you're going to starve to death. I don't want either one. And the point is, you've turned away from God and here come the consequences. And so, at least take that away from the book of Joel. Here is, I think, the real message of Joel in chapter 2, starting in verse 18. And down to verse 27, what Joel is saying to this people is, here comes the plague because you've turned away from me. But almost none of the prophets leave it at that. The message is, but if you will repent, if you will turn away from your sin and come back to me, we can just avoid all of this. And there can be restoration and there can be hope. And there doesn't have to be famine and there doesn't have to be war. An army start in chapter 2 and verse 18. Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied, and I will, make, uh, I will, I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. I will remove the northerner far from you. That makes me think about an actual army. If you're in Jerusalem, Assyria, and Babylon, and Persia, and Greece, and Rome, they all came from the north. God says, um, I will remove the northerner far from you, and I will drive him into a parched and desolate land, his vanguard into the eastern sea, and his rear guard into the western sea, for the stench and foul smell of him will rise, for he has done great things. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Fear not, you beast of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green. The tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and the vine give their full yield. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the latter rain as before. Um, would you star, I don't care how you do it, remember that verse? One of the things that God says in the way of restoration is, in this land that has been totally destroyed, what I'm going to do is I'm going I'm to pour down rain and life and water the land and bring everything back. I'm specifically interested in the word pour. He's poured down abundant rain. 24. 
The threshing floors shall be full of grain. The vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, and my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is none else and my people shall never again be put to shame. So here is at least... of the things you should remember about the book of Joel. The book of Joel is just like every other message in the rest of the Bible. If you turn away from God, there are going to be devastating consequences. But it doesn't have to be like that. If you will come back to him, God has said from the very start that I will restore you. It doesn't have to be plague. I will pour rain out on the ground and, and there will be life and everything will be good. And maybe not in this life, but his promise is that he'll take care of his people. Let's keep reading in chapter 2 and verse 28. Um, and I'll tell you, before we start reading in chapter 2 and verse 28, this should sound familiar to you. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions even on the male and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit. Remember earlier how I said pay attention to the word pour there's drought in the land. It's, it's famine. And what God says is, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pour out the rain and it's going to be life. And I'm going to bring life back to a dead place that happened because of sin. In chapter 2 and verses 28 and 29, what God says is, on this land, world, full of death and destruction because of sin and turning away from God, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. And the reason why that matters is because in Acts chapter 2 and verse 16, you can see it. Turn over there and look at it. Mark it in your Bible so that you remember this reference. When, when the apostles... Uh, got the Holy Spirit and they were speaking the gospel for the very first time. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 16, Peter says, this is what Joel was talking about. He says the word specifically. The thing that you're seeing right now, the Spirit of God and the words of the gospel going out to the dead and sinful world that's what Joel was talking about when he said, I'm going to pour out life on a world. And the reason why I think this means something for us, should mean something for us, is because ultimately Joel is pointing us to Jesus and salvation and the repentance of sins that come through Jesus. Let's keep reading in chapter 2 and verse 30. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Just like earlier when Joel said, I'm going to send my plague and it's going to be either grasshoppers or an army. And he said, the moon's going to go dark and the sky's going to go dark. It's, it's, it's figurative language to describe. This is going to be something really big deal. That's what's going on here in verse 30. At 31, the sun will be turned to darkness. The moon will be turned to blood. This is going to be an earth shattering deal when it happens. Verse 32, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be those who escape as the Lord has said. And among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. That is something worth remembering. Verse 32. It shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
Um, so here it is, uh, the story of Jesus and how the world that we live in is just ravaged and the consequences of sin. But what God has done is poured out His Spirit, rain, life on the plague-ridden world, and said, if you will call on the name of the Lord, you don't have to live in the consequences of sin. Um, if you're here tonight, this is not quite the invitation. If you're here tonight, and you're not a Christian, I think the, the book of Joel, the prophet Joel, is maybe one of the best books for you to picture. What is my soul before Jesus? It's like a desolate land that's been eaten by grasshoppers. That's, that's what your soul is dead. It's over. It's dark and barren. And what does God do through Jesus and his life-giving spirit? He waters the dead land. That's our hope. That's Christianity. So, Joel's message for us today. Do you remember how I started by saying I don't know any of the, I don't know anything about the book of Joel, um, the messenger? I don't know very much about Joel. Here's the thing: it doesn't matter because it's not Joel's message. And it doesn't matter how much or what you know about me. It doesn't matter because what I've said to you tonight is not my message. It's God's. These are God's words that we're listening to. When did Joel write? Doesn't matter. Because his message is true for all people, in all times, in all places. Whether it was the 7th century BC or almost to the time of Greece, it still matters as much for us right now as it did for the original people that he was talking to. What did the people do? That made God so upset that he said, I'm sending the locust plague on you. Doesn't matter. It's sin and turning away from God. Uh, and, and that's the same sin problem that we're faced with. Whether it's you know financial, economic sin, like we're going to see in, in Amos and Hosea, or, or some other kind of moral sin. Doesn't matter. Sin is the problem and turning away from God. Um... Uh, what about uh, the consequences? Uh, it doesn't matter if the locust plague uh, is, is drought and literal grasshoppers uh, or an invading army. The point is that God is going to punish sin and evil. And so these questions are how I came up with my one sentence summary of Joel. I think you'll see each of these four things in our one sentence, what is the book of Joel? God, remember the messenger, has spoken to all generations. The date doesn't matter. The crime doesn't matter and the consequences don't matter. Repent or face devastating consequences. That's the book of Joel. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, um, it's been a while since I've preached just an outright sin, Jesus is the answer, and here's salvation sermon. This is it. If you're ready to become a Christian, we would love to help you with that. Make your needs known and come forward as together the invitation song.